We're here for episode two in a 52-part series as we journey week by week through the Daily Stoic, Ryan Holiday. Um, I will be presenting one day, the day that I found most encouraging, um, each video. So the, the reading is not necessarily a must. You don't have to have this book to follow the series. I strongly suggest it because this has so far been... Um, I think an incredible experience and also I so I've dabbled I, I've had this book for almost a year I bought it in March last year I think something like that but I was like ah, oh, I'm not gonna start this three months in I should have absolutely I should have and you do not have to start this from January 1st in order to I think get um, quite the experience out of it the full experience maybe not but uh, I, what's to stop you from deciding that you did well this year um, by catching up on the reading and then going day by day and then doing it again next year, right? I think I think something like this is profitable on more than one occasion. It's profitable for more than one year. By the time you get to day 365, wherever your day one was, by the time you get to day 365, everything's going to be not forgotten, but digested in a different way. And I have to say this. The one thing I think that has been most surprising to me thus far through... 14 days of reading here. I don't know where else they go from here. So basically everything that I know about the core tenets of uh, Stoicism have been presented in one way, shape, form, fashion, facet, or manner so far in this book. So I am extremely excited. At least all of the major talking points whenever you um, try to ingest something on Stoicism. So I'm ex excited to see from where this goes uh, moving forward. But the day that I really want to present here is January 8th, Seeing Our Addictions. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about page 22, which is uh, January 14th, because I think that if my main through thought with this section of the reading is from this January 8th portion of the book, then I think that it is the January 14th portion of this reading that really sort of s surmises my thoughts and experiences with this tenet of Stoicism. Every time I say Stoicism, I want to say nihilism because I've spent so much time reading about nihilism um, in the past few years, so much time uh, talking about nihilism and writing about nihilism the past couple of years that... Uh, it really is pervading my thoughts. But January 8th, with the subtitle, Seeing Our Addictions, uh, we get a quote from Seneca, Seneca, Moral Letters. The quote from Seneca reads as such, We must give up many things to which we are addicted, considering them to be good. Otherwise, courage will vanish, which should continually test itself. Greatness of soul will be lost which can't stand out unless it disdains as petty what the mob regards as most desirable. i got to read that again, because I think that it is something where, for me, what I do when I read that quote is I start thinking about it while the words are still happening. Um, I sound illiterate when I talk that way, but I, I think you understand from, from where I'm coming. We must give up many things to which we are addicted, considering them to be good. Otherwise, courage will vanish, which should continually test itself. Greatness of soul will be lost, which can't stand out unless it disdains as petty what the mob regards as most desirable. And we get this, the snippet from the authors here. What we consider to be harmless indulgences can easily become full-blown addictions. We start with coffee in the morning, and soon enough, we can't start the day without it. We check our email because it's part of our job, and soon enough, we feel the phantom buzz of the phone in our pocket every few seconds. Soon enough, these harmless habits are running our lives. The little compulsions and drives we have not only chip away at our freedom and sovereignty, they cloud our clarity. We think we're in control, but are we really? As one addict put it, the addiction is when we've 
quote, lost the freedom to abstain, end quote. Let us reclaim that freedom. What that addiction is for you can vary. Soda, drugs, complaining, gossip, the internet, biting your nails. But you must reclaim the ability to abstain because within its because within it your clarity. I'll try that sentence one more time. This is a really well written book. It's very clear. I just stumble over words because it seems I'm functionally illiterate. What that addiction is for you can vary. Soda, drugs, complaining, gossip, the internet, biting your nails. But you must reclaim the ability to abstain because within it is your clarity and self-control. I think that this is a big one in today's world, and I think that in today's world, one of the most um, insidious ways which addiction creeps into our daily life is with ease, is with convenience. So at, right now, we are in, I am in, I don't know when you're watching this. I am in January, the second week of January, 2022. I am seeing in my retail job, I work retail overnights. We're out of a lot of stuff. We don't have a lot of stuff. If you want a COVID test, you have not been able to get one for weeks now. And our addiction to convenience, to ease of use, our convenience to having whatever the hell it is, whenever the hell we want it, has caused a lot of people. So this, this, within it is your clarity and self-control. This little test of random retail places, not having everything you want right when you want it and as many as you need or think you want, is absolutely thrashing people's clarity and self-control. Everyone understands, or should, or has the tools to understand. We're in difficult times. Supply chains are wrecked. People have hoarded things, and um, who can blame them? You don't know when you're going to get them again. Everyone knows this. So when some lady comes in to the corner store, at 3.30 in the morning, demanding a COVID test, and I tell her, we don't have any. And she replies with, you should be ordering them. You've lost your clarity. You've lost your self-control. You've lost the self-control to understand, obviously, this fellow working overnights here doesn't need a tongue lashing because the world is out of COVID tests. You lost self-control. That's fine. But you also lost clarity because, of course, no one has COVID tests, right? Um, so that, I think, is really pervasive in today's world, this idea of everything should be easy, everything should be there when I want it. Abstaining from ease of use is difficult, but I think it's necessary. Uh, I think that in today's world, one thing that has treated me particularly well is being a Luddite. I'm terrible with electronics. I'm terrible with all things computer. Um, so nothing is easy for me. I, I have to pay rent by mail. All of my bills I have to pay on the telephone, right? Um, and I think that's actually a strength for me because when... Let me tell you, this is how I brag. Um, I think that's a strength for me because when little inconveniences like this pop up, I'm used to things being inconvenient. Um, now, that's a bug, not a feature, right? But in, to, in, in, to, in this little moment in time, it's proving useful for me because I go places and, oh, this place is closed today because everyone has COVID. Okay, right? Um, but this idea here, what your addiction is, can vary. Soda, drugs, complaining, gossip, the internet, biting your nails, all of these things are things to which someone can be addicted, right? I think you can also 
be addicted to productivity. Toxic productivity, as they call it. But I think there's a lot... So, I've been to church very few times in my life, but one of the times that I went to church, the um, I went because the pastor was a guy that I had met at the gym. And the pastor, he said, look, I'm new here, you know, a big guy. I mean, he was declining 405 pounds, and I asked, this is how I met him. He was declining 405 pounds, bench press, right? I said, hey, do you need a spot? And he looked at me and said, no, thanks. All right, guy. Well, if you're talking at the church, I'll listen. Uh, so he told me he was going to be uh, giving... The lecture? What do they call it at church? I don't, I, I'm not 100% sure. The sermon. He was given the sermon that week. So I was like, yeah, I'll show up. Yeah. And he's given this talk, and I, I brought the girl I was dating at the time. And he goes off, and he's talk, she's talking about something like this. He's talking about addiction. He's talking about the way that um, addictions uh, can lead you from God. And he says, maybe you're addicted to alcohol. Maybe you're addicted to drugs. Maybe you're addicted to sex. Maybe you're addicted to internet pornography. In the middle of church, he just says, maybe you're addicted to internet pornography. And I thought, oh my God, how does he know? You know, um, but it was just one of those moments that I realized, yeah, the addiction thing is more common than you think. And it's not just the people who are addicted to drugs. It's not just the people who are addicted to alcohol. Addiction probably strikes just about everyone. Um, and by forsaking those things to which we are addicted, one extra little feature that is not talked about in this blurb, say you're addicted to coffee. You give up coffee for a month. Say you give up coffee for, I don't know, November. December 1st, that first coffee, really amazing. No coffee in November. I call it no bean November. You know, you just give up coffee for one month. So for me, I, um, and basically what I'm doing with this series is trying to sort of uh, almost journal my way through this a little bit, right? So putting this on camera like this, maybe someone else gets something out of it, hopefully. But this past summer, Things were going awful at work, as, as they were with a lot of people's work, a lot of different places this summer. Um, we lost employee after employee, people calling in, all sorts of things. Uh, bad from pillar to post, right? And um, I do a list of goals every year, and I, I was getting pretty... Um, pretty close to the deadline, so I set goals on my birthday as opposed to New Year's, right? Well, I wanted to lose some weight during during this year, and my birthday's in September. So coming up on my birthday, I had lost no weight because a lot of work, right? A lot of overtime, a lot of hours. So we get to summer. I think it was June. I worked like 21 days in a row. Then... After that, I'm working like six day weeks. Then I think it was August, I worked 27 days in a row. So out of 100 days, man, I probably worked 90, 92 of them. And um, I was trying to lose weight as well. So I was, I was walking slash running. I was getting about 150 miles a month on my feet whether that is walking at, at the park or running at the park or at the gym. And um, trying to lose weight that way. And I, I just said to myself, look, I'm not going to let the fact that all of this work is, I'm having to do this work, I'm having to work all of these crazy hours. I'm not going to let that destroy the goal that I have for myself to, I didn't lose as much weight as I wanted to, but I lost, I lost quite a bit of weight. I'm not going to let this other circumstance ruin this for me. So I was still getting those 150 miles a month on top of working 50 and 60 and 70 hour weeks. That adds up. 
And I was, I drink an energy drink every night. Night being my morning, right? So I, I wake up basically and pound a caffeine drink. I was doing two a day at that point. By, by the time that the summer ended, and a little bit after, like I didn't stop this as soon as the summer ended and I quit getting all of those miles because I still got two more, three more hundred mile months after that. But June, July, August, then September, October, and November, I got a hundred plus miles on all those months. But um, I was going, I'm drinking like a rain energy drink, 300 milligrams of caffeine, drinking another energy drink, 200 to 300 milligrams of caffeine. That's 500 to 600 milligrams of caffeine. And then I was getting off work. And that would be when I would go do my walking, my running, my exercise. But I was also trying to make videos. I was also trying to write. So I was pounding a coffee after work. Um, so there were probably days where I was getting 600, 700 milligrams of caffeine. 700 million, and I knew, look, this isn't good. This is bad news. My kidneys are probably a, a granite rock right now. So I cold turkey, and it's, you're going to laugh when I tell you how long, but for three days, no caffeine. It was a weekend, my weekend. I slept. I don't get eight hours of sleep a night. I slept like nine hours two of those nights. Still woke up with a pounding headache, all three days that I was that I was given that I had given up caffeine. I gave up caffeine for three days, and had a headache. For three days. Um, that sucked, right? But that next caffeine drink, man, that next Red Bull. No, I, I've been able to cut back to a single energy drink every day. But the only other times I'll get caffeine is if I, I write every day after work. So sometimes I will get a coffee after work as well. Um, but, what, but giving that up, that addiction, that addiction to caffeine, giving that up for three days... By the time I did go back to caffeine, I was able to drastically reduce the amount of caffeine that I was taking in. Um, and so that's one story where, where this has helped me. Um, but another time, I, um, let's see, it seems like work makes me addicted to things. Uh, the summer after I graduated from college, the summer after I got my bachelor's degree, I was working a retail job full-time. I was working a second retail job at a bookstore. Books slash music slash game. It was called Hastings. It was a weird place. I was working at part-time. And I had a manual labor job where I was scraping a house, painting a house, doing lawn work, all this sort of stuff for a family. And that same summer, the woman who was the love of my life sort of sort of left me. Like, we just sort of grew apart, I think. Um, but I wasn't ready for that. And I would go, for, so I was working seven days a week in the summer, outdoors five days a week. 100 degrees up on a ladder, paint dried paint all over me, right? Scraping a house, right? All this stuff. And I would go from whatever I worked last, whether that was my retail job or my bookstore job, I would go straight from there to the bar. And I would drink. And when I say drink, I mean drink. And I carried that addiction with me all the way to grad school. And my daily habit at grad school was I would wake up around eight, eight or nine, get to the library, 
9 or 10, because that's when they opened. And I would work at the library, reading, writing, not work, work, but reading, writing all my studies until they closed or 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, I would go to the gym. I think they were open late at the library. I can't remember. Anyway, I would go to the gym from the library. And then I would go home and try to write. Now, I had convinced myself that in order to write, an Adrian has to drink. So I would walk to the gas station that was a block away from the, the apartment, buy a bag of beef jerky, and whatever whiskey I could afford at that point. And I would eat beef jerky, drink whiskey, and write. That was the only way I could write at that time. I had convinced myself. I have since learned only mostly. No, I have since learned I don't have to I don't have to drink to write. But it helped me. It helped to loosen me up. But the thing is, if you're depending if I'm depending on alcohol to help me loosen up so that I can write, I will never learn how to loosen up. I will always have to have some help to loosen up. So I will never train myself to get over that. I will just rely on that thing to get over it. And then what happens is you pay the secondary consequences of your addiction. I gained a lot of weight. Health started failing a lot. You lose time in the mornings if you got too drunk. Right? All of these things. Editing takes a whole lot more a whole lot longer, a whole lot more work when you were absolutely sloshed while you were writing. So that is another um, story from me. But I think what this leads to is here on 22, January 14th, with the subheading, Cut the Strings That Pull Your Mind. A quote from Marcus Aurelius, Understand, at last, that you have something in you more powerful and divine than what causes the bodily passions and pulls you like a mere puppet. What thoughts now occupy my mind? Is not, is it not, is it not fear, suspicion, desire, or something like that? And the quote, the uh, excerpt from the authors here. Think of all the interests vying for a share of your wallet or for a second of your attention. Food scientists are engineering products to exploit your taste buds. Silicon Valley engineers are designing applications as addictive as gambling. The media is manufacturing stories to provoke outrage and anger. These are just a small slice of the temptations and forces acting on us, distracting us and pulling us away from things that truly matter. Marcus, thankfully, was not exposed to these extreme parts of our modern culture. But he knew plenty of distracting sinkholes, too. Gossip, the endless call of work, uh, as well as fear, suspicion, lust. Every human being is pulled by these internal and external forces that are increasingly more powerful and harder to resist. Philosophy is simply asking us to pay careful attention and strive to be more than a pawn. As Viktor Frankl put it in The, the Will to Meaning, quote, man is pushed by drives and pulled by values, end quote. These values and inner awareness prevent us from being puppets. Sure, paying attention requires work and awareness, but, it, but isn't it better that being, than being jerked about on a string? So this quote, man is pushed by drives, but pulled by virtues. For my example with grad school, I was being pushed by the drive to write, to create, to add to American letters, to contribute to thought in some way. But I was not pulled hard enough by my virtues. I was, I was allowing myself to fall into this terrible trap of sacrificing tomorrow for a squeezing a little bit more out of today. 
anything that I could squeeze out of today, because today's what we have. We know we have today. We don't know about tomorrow. So I was trying to squeeze every bit that I could out of today and forsaking tomorrow. Um, yeah, and I think that is a that is a healthy counterbalance to these addictions that we rely on in order for productivity. If you're finding this video, probably most of your addictions are for productive purposes. I think, probably. If you're watching a video about stoicism on some random small YouTuber's channel, probably it's because you are, um, if you have an addiction, it is to something that contributes your, your main addictions will probably be to something that contributes to productivity or you think contributes to productivity in some fashion. And with those addictions, we very rarely think about the underlying um, consequences that help us, that, that, that help us now, but are absolutely harming us later. Uh, and I think that it is necessary to take those things into account and remember that if we're relying on something like caffeine for productivity, like alcohol for productivity, we're only pulling forward productivity from what can be experienced later. And we're also, we're also dampening future productivity to an extreme degree, as well as not taking it as incumbent upon ourselves to train in the disciplines necessary. So for me, with writing, I was not able to just sit, I thought I was not able to just sit down and write. It's because I hadn't trained those muscles. Um, with this past summer and all the caffeine, yeah, caffeine stops you from being tired, but I could have just woken up and done 10 jumping jacks and 30 push-ups and been right where I should have been, taken a cold shower and been right where I needed to be. But I didn't do that. I, re I relied too heavily upon the shortcut of caffeine. That is all I have for this week two in the Daily Stoic. Um, hope to have you back next week.